Okay, Gospel Bass Lines family, how's everybody doing? Well, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's lesson. Dealing more with the traditional gospel sound. Uh, we're going to be in the key of E flat during this lesson. Just want to show you guys a couple of things to add to your walk lines when we're doing like the typical um, praise break, um, shouting music walk line, congregational song walk line. We're going to work with a slower tempo because everything you can do at the slow tempo, you can pretty much speed it up and do it the faster tempo or some sort of variation of it. Um, as far as note selection though, that's what we'll look at today. Why certain things work, why certain, why certain licks and certain runs work, and how do I go about developing. Hopefully I can kind of give you a little bit of insight on things you can look for. So let's go ahead and get started. We're in the key of E flat. Okay. The typical walk line is, um, if you deal with the number system, is one. Since we're in the key of E flat, E flat will be the one. Um, the major third, so we'll go to three, then four, flat five, five, six, dominant seven, or flat seven, the seven, the major seven, and then back to one. So we're playing E flat, G, A flat, A, B flat, C, C sharp, or D flat, then D, then E flat. Notice those four notes, and let's you know kind of even notice the pattern. You've got four fingers for four frets. And just again, always remember to play at the front of each fret, um, and we'll talk about that more why that's important in another lesson. So uh, let's let's go ahead and look at some of the things that we normally do. Let's start with the basic line, you know, and we'll do it slow. And we pretty much repeat that line, you know, in our in the shout music. You might even do variations of the um, the octaves, and so that basic line is pretty much what we do even in our congregational songs, in the call and response songs. You know, at least for the first part before we go through the chord pro the chord progression and go to the next chord, whatever it may be, depending on whatever song we're doing. Um, so let's just work in one section. Let's just work in this E flat section, just this repetitive line. And you ask yourself, what is it about that you know line that you know? What's the mystery to this music and all the stuff I can add to it? Um, you know, how do I go about building licks and riffs and, you know, why does it sound good? Why do people, you know, like it so much? You know, so many questions. Well, there's some basic, simple things that are really interesting about this music and, and kind of help you come up with ideas and things you want to add. Let's start with the first chord, you know. Um, you've got E flat. And then from the E flat, you go into the major third, which is G. So just that interval alone almost opens you up for ideas that are based upon major arpeggios. Um, one, three, five, and one. Now the first, you have to, first thing I guess you have to ask yourself is, um, is this major or is this minor when we're playing this music, you know? Because you'll hear minor chords played on top of it from the keyboard players and the guitar players, and you'll hear major chords, you'll hear combinations of them, you know, and you're trying to figure out, well, which one is it? And we'll cover that, you know, as we're looking more into this lesson. Because um, there's elements of both. There's elements of major and there's elements of minor. Um, so for this first example, you know, we look at the, the E flat to the G, that's a major third. That's our first interval, you know, E flat to G is a major third. Okay, well, here's the cool thing about um, chords. Uh, when, you're, when you're spelling out a chord or an arpeggio, you'll play one, three, five, and if there's a seventh element, you can add that. If there's a nine, eleven, and thirteen, you can go on until the cows come home, you know. <laughs> so you've got E flat, which is our one, then our three, our five. Now, first of all, the one is the same whether it's major or minor. If I play E flat major, the one is E flat. If I play E flat minor, the one is still E flat, right? Um, the five is the same whether it's major, one, two, three, four, five, or minor. The five is the same. Um, so the only things that are really going to change are our third and our sevenths. If I play major, I end up on D, which is the seventh in E flat, right? That's a major seven. If I play minor, then I end up on D flat. So there's elements of both. So when we put all that together, You've covered, you know, you justified the G being there in E flat major. One, two, three, 
G is the third of E flat major. Four is the fourth of E flat no matter what. It's a perfect fourth from E flat. So whether it's E flat minor or E flat major, that four works. So that's a very strong note. That's something that we're going to look at more when we deal with the chord progression. Um, we haven't discussed the A yet. We'll come to that in just a second. The five, we've justified because whether it's major or minor, that five is going to be the same. The six, if it's major, then that six works. If it's minor, then we'd have a, that B, you know, which would be a, the, that minor six, right? Um, we've discussed the D flat because if it's minor, we could have that minor seventh there. Um, but we're going to refer to this more as a dominant seventh and not a minor seventh, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, after that, you've got D, which we said if it's E flat major, we could justify that D being there. So that's one perspective to look at this line as a series or a combination of major and minor elements. And that's probably a very simplistic way, an entry level way to look at it. It gets a little more complicated when we move past just, you know, major or minor elements and start to look at each chord in isolation. Um, but that's entry, that, that's an entry way level to look at it to just get started with justifying the notes, you know, that it's they apply to either E flat major or E flat minor. The one we didn't discuss yet was that diminished interval, that, you know, that A, that A there, that diminished interval. And we'll, we'll justify that diminished interval momentarily, but I think before I cover that, let's look more into this major and minor mystery, you know, how this can work together um, in this music. A lot of the times when we're trying to build riffs, you know, over this music, or even when we're just playing, you know, church, um, playing, just playing in church, and you know, you might be doing runs over that music, or think of a run to do, right? You might hear like maybe the guitarist or the keyboardist, and they might do like a minor pentatonic run, which is the the run, the one or the root, whatever your whatever key you're in, the one, the minor third. And I'm, I'm going to use a pattern that's really strategic to help yourself memorize these minor pentatonics. I'm going to use my fourth finger and my first finger. I'm going to play um, the root or the one with my fourth finger. Then I'm going to play the minor third. Notice that little diagonal kind of pattern from here, from here to here. So from my fourth finger to my first finger. Then I'm going to shift to the four. So I've got one, minor third, four which is the same whether it's major or minor, and then five, which is the same whether it's major or minor, dominant seven or minor seven, and then back to one. Now notice why I shifted where I shifted. I've said four, one, shift. Four, um, four again, one, four. Because most of the notes are right here in this region, so I'm going to use a finger pattern that puts me you know, in the place where the majority of my notes are. That's my fingering position. I'm going to stay in position where the majority of my notes are. So if you're wondering when to shift, usually I'll shift on my first finger if I'm coming, you know, this way up the bass, and I'll shift on my fourth finger if I'm going that way. It just depends, though. It's not like all. It's not always like that. Um, so you could use a minor pentatonic run over these lines. So. All I did was just kept going down to the five, just for to have enough beats. You know, you gotta stay on beat, and then back to beat one again, right? So I can use that minor pentatonic going up, I played it in two octaves. Started the same thing: four finger, you know, fourth finger, shift. I can use my minor pentatonic. I can use my major pentatonic. Um, I know you're probably saying, wow, that's pretty interesting. And I'll show you why um, when we play the track. You got the major pentatonic. It's the one or E flat, shift to F. And I'm going to use this fingering for a reason as well. Watch the fingerings. There's other ways I could play this, but I use these fingering strategically because when you're playing music, it's more of a musical fingering to me. It's more musical to, for me to play one, two, three this way versus one, two, three that way. If I'm playing a lick or a fast scale, I might have to play one, two, three, you know, that way. But to get that kind of musical essence of sliding up and down the strings, you know, stuff like that. Like three, two, one, to get that kind of effect, you can't do that doing that. 
it doesn't have the same effect, no. Or even that slide, you know, one string, you know. Just strum the string one time. You can kind of just sweep, you know, over everything. And without even using your other hand. So, um, I use these fingerings for a reason. They're just, it's real musical and it kind of just puts you into a groove when you're playing that way. So, E flat, F, G, which is 1, 2, 3, 5, which is B flat, 6, which is C, and back to E flat. And then repeat the same thing in the next octave. Watch, watch the pattern. Notice when I shift. E flat, shift on 2, right? So, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 1. One, two, three, five, six, one, two, three. So I can use the minor pentatonic or the major pentatonic over these lines. And all I'm doing is just kind of going back and forth. Not so much like you're trying to memorize a lick, it's just that you have those notes to pull from. And all you've got to consider is how many beats do I have before I need to get somewhere where I can kind of resolve and get back into the basic walk again. So, um, with that in mind, let's kind of work on a couple of things and I'll talk about more of it um, as we progress um, through this lesson of exploring this traditional gospel sound. I'm going to run the track at 80 BPMs. The track is not spectacular at all. I had to do it myself. Um, forgive me if it doesn't sound you know, great. But it'll be enough for us to kind of go over some of these lines so you can see how I can incorporate some of this stuff. Major pentatonic and minor pentatonic, right? I've tried my hardest not to do too many things outside of what I discussed. Um, it's just a lot of the stuff is just habit from playing so long. Um, hopefully you heard the difference in those minor um, pentatonics versus those major pentatonics. And you kind of notice I was skipping some of the intervals just so it wouldn't sound so um, elementary to where you were just playing up completely up the entire scale. Yeah. So, and plus you have to also consider like the number of beats you have, you know, those are five notes that make up that scale. And so you got to kind of do the math, okay, if I play all five of them, how many beats am I, if I'm playing eighth notes, do I need to make up for a few more beats, you know, to get to, you know, four beats, you know, for the measure. So you can explore that and come up with different patterns. Um, you can use some of the ones I did or come up with, you know, um, just whatever you want to, just throw the notes together. Um, the cool thing about it is when you're playing that basic walk line, the chords and all the things you can kind of add into this music combine major and minor elements. And that's pretty much the majority of what I want to get across in this first phase of this lesson. This is just the first phase, is combining those major and those minor elements together. Um, you know, let's, let's look at some of the other things that are happening here. Um, so, one, get to the third. We can start thinking in terms of arpeggios. We can think in terms of, you know, one, three, five, one, right? One to the three. When I get to that third. Um, and what we could do if we had time is sit down and look at every single chord, you know, uh, especially going through the preaching chords of how it works. So from the one chord, you can look at um, one, three, five, or you can look minor. But one, um, one, three, five, one, or one, minor third, five, one. Just depending on what chord the keyboard player is playing. He might hit an E flat minor, he might hit an E flat major. Um, when you're building lines and solo licks, you want to you know the honest truth? It really doesn't matter. Because <laughs> you're not going to hit the note long enough. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to play major and minor thirds. You ready? Mm -hmm. 
I'm just gonna mix them up just at random times. Just mix them all up. Major thirds, minor thirds. I'll give you an idea and I'm just you know just playing things randomly so you hear those major thirds and minor thirds well that's the cool thing about some of the licks that work watch this this lick that we play all the time it's the one two um, are you let me use the right numbers one two or one nine <laughs> one two then um, this would be a sharp nine technically but it, why would you say sharp nine it's, it sounds really crazy that's the crazy thing about music theory if you're confused already, music theory sometimes will confuse you more until you really get a grasp of it. So I'll just call it one, two, and I'll just call this the minor third for right now. Okay, I won't call it a sharp nine, I'll call it a minor third, major third, okay? One, two, minor third, major third, five, six, one. So one, two, minor third, major third, five, six, one. Two, minor third, major third. So when we play that lick, we're automatically inviting the major and the minor scale to come together. Because what's the big difference in a major chord and a minor chord? I mean, you're only listening for the third interval. The third and the seventh are what really makes the difference. It's the third and the seventh. That spells the chord. So the one and the five are the same. One, five. But the major third, one minor third. Okay? Um, well, that kind of... Um, segues in more to a, a scale that we can apply um, even to this music as well if you're looking for a scale because the E flat major scale doesn't necessarily work with it and the E flat minor scale doesn't necessarily work with it so we need, we need a scale that combines enough major with enough minor and the best scale you know because um, listen to the music So, um, the best scale for that sound is to add the major third, but then you need something, you don't want that major seven, because that major seven will clash so hard. But that minor seven, that dominant seven, sounds beautiful. So one of the things that um, I would look for if I were you is a scale that has a major third and a minor seventh. Well, that's mixolydian mode. And mixolydian mode in the key of E flat, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D flat, E flat. So you've got a minor seven and a major third. Now this is going to really become cool to like a lot of the keyboard players, the guys that play bass and keyboard, because now you're starting to um, see the foundations of uh, what we call tritones. And as a bass player, you can have a lot of fun once you start to understand the tritones that are going on in the keyboard player's left hand. Um, and so. We, this is just about to open up a huge, you know, um, a discussion on things, you know, so I don't want to get too far off on a tangent. Let's just focus more on building this basic line, you know, the, the groove elements of it. So E flat, G, A flat, A, um, B flat, C, D flat, D, E flat. Now we just talked about mixolydian mode. Let's just hear the scale itself over the music so we can kind of hear how, you know, it just fits in the notes. But I just want you to hear the notes. I mean, I wouldn't suggest I wouldn't suggest building a line on the scale. I just want you to hear the scale that the notes fit, right? Okay. Hopefully, I accomplished that. Let's move on. We've got mixolydian mode we can use. We've got um, major and minor arpeggios we can pull from. We've got a major pentatonic and a minor pentatonic we can pull from. Um, we've got our blues scale we can pull from, which is one minor third four flat five five dominant seven and back to one. I hope you guys are getting a kick out of this because I'm having a lot of fun here. So we've got our blue scale. 
Our minor pentatonic. Our major pentatonic. The little bebop lick with the little minor third, major third thing. And even, um, you can add so many passing tones. One, two, minor third, major third, five. You can walk it up to six, you know. Five, sharp five, six. Um, another thing you can do, take elements of that, uh, of the scales that we're using. Take elements of, um... The mixolydian mode, but play it like you're playing the um, the little bebop look I just played. One, two, minor third, major third, five, six, dominant seven. Or maybe take the minor third off this time and just play one, two, three, five, six, dominant seven. Or maybe start on that minor on that minor third to the major third. Or do the whole thing. In fact, a lot of the quartet lines you might hear, um, the guitar player play that, or maybe the bass player, they do it together. some things out. Again, this is just phase one. Um, the next phase of this is we'll start taking each individual chord apart and study it in isolation, you know, and that'll probably take um, some time for each individual chord. Just to see options, you know, we just want to open up and explore the options of what I could possibly do in this music. Um, and then we start dealing with the rhythm, the rhythm aspects and, um, you know, borrowed chords. And so, it, it's, it's endless. It's an, it's an endless study. Don't ever get bored playing these you know, simple bass lines I mean, because there's so much to learn from them. In fact, in this one, I'm going to try to add in as much as I can think of and just play for a while. And then as much as I can remember what I played, I'll, um, I'll go back and reteach in just a moment. And feel free to um, respond to the video, ask questions. I want to make sure I cover everything that you guys want to learn. Um, respond, you know, respond, respond, respond. Send reply videos, whatever you want to do. I'm going to try to throw in the whole kitchen sink right now at 80 BPMs and then after that I'll speed it up to like shout speed and there's, uh, obviously I won't be able to play as fast you know as far as a lot of the 16th um, and a little triplet you know um, notes but uh, I'll be able to still use the same concepts and build some fast walking lines. So let's hit the music.
Okay, so those were um, just a series of various examples of using the minor and using the major. If there was something in there that you heard that you know really stuck out to you, just kind of point out the time that it took place on the video, and I'll break that individual segment down. Um, there's still so much more we can add. We haven't started really working with the diminished intervals and the things we can do with that. Um, <clears throat> and we'll start talking more about those borrowed chords and those um, secondary dominants and things of that nature in the second phase of this video. So this is the first phase. I'm going to take the same track just to kind of close this out, speed it up more to like you know the shout beat that we're used to. Uh, maybe a little bit slower just so you can kind of hear all the individual notes. Um, some of the things I'll use, you know, a, a lot of it is rhythmic and a lot of it is feel based. Again, this video we're kind of just focusing more on the note selection. So, here we go. Uh, let's go to about 150. That's pretty fast. I think some of us, you know, grew up playing at about 170 and some of us grew up playing it a little bit slower, but 150 is right in the middle somewhere, so let's go for it. Right. Don't kick your computer over. that mixolydian mode in action there coming down and then hit that minor third to the major third and that's a lot of the licks that I'm doing are kind of playing on the minor third to the major third and there's a ghost note all I'm playing is notice I'm not doing I'm just hitting it one time hit the open string hammer on strum the open string hammer on that ghost note is not even in the key signature. It's just there to keep create like a rhythm beat, you know. You know, if I was going to play the actual note. You know. Six. Five. But we're not worried about playing the actual note. We're just creating a ghost note just for an effect. So, minor third, major third. Back up. thing about this line, why people love it so much, is the one and the five, and how they just keep going back and forth. One, five. Watch. I'm going to show you. You hear it? One, five, 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 one, five. The one and the five really just make this, you know, come to life. And so the more you can kind of manipulate how you get from one to five, that's the beauty of the whole thing. How you get from one to five or how you ignore five and play um, a note that, you know, it's um, part of the, the harmonic or the chord structure of that five. Um, so if that five was like a minor, like whatever else you can play over that, that kind of makes, or if it's a dominant seven, whatever else you can play over that five, you know, so there's a great mystery, um, you know, behind um, uh, of what can possibly be created, you know, by just your understanding of what we call secondary dominance or the fifth of the fifth. For example, in the key of E flat, B flat is a five. Well, what's the fifth of B flat? F. F is the fifth of B flat, right? So th the kind of things I can create from how I get from E flat to B flat, well, I could probably use that secondary dominant. Um, somehow get to F to go to B flat. And one way you can do that. So is doing this simple turnaround. One, three, six, two, five. So if you break it down, you got one. Alright. Uh, there's your one chord, one chord, one, three, 
six, two, five, one. So, so you play one, three, six, two, five. So when I put that in there. I can play one, three, six, two, five. So, um. So I could go one, three, six, two, five, or I could um, maybe drag it out a little bit more. One, three, six. One, three, six. Instead of going two, five, one, three, six. Let's take the two chord apart. Um, F, A, and E flat. It's a dominant seven because it's secondary dominance. The five of the five chord. One. Right here's one. Here's five. The five of this is. The five of B flat is F, right? So let's just make a dominant chord on F. A dominant chord is one, three, and a dominant seven, or a flat seven. And it sounds like that. It's a dominant seven chord. So with that in mind, any of those notes in that chord, including the five itself too, right? One, three, five, seven. I can use any one of those in place of the F. And same thing for the, the B flat. If it's a dominant seven chord I was playing, I could use any any one of those, one, three, five, dominant seven. Same thing on the one. One, three, five, seven. So I could play any one of those, you know, theoretically in place of that root chord, and it would sound good. And that's why, you know, you hear a lot of guys, they avoid the root just by understanding that, you know, they, they intentionally stay off the root. So you might hear them come in in places where you wouldn't normally come in. Let me try to put some of that together so you can see that up to speed. Yeah, let me slow that down. So five, I'm walking backwards. Five, um, diminish five, four, three. Now you notice there's a lot of fourth moves, you know, our fifth, fourths and fifths, you know, in my lines when I'm doing those, um, um, those, it almost sounds like a chord progression being created when there's not even a chord pro progression taking place. And that's what makes it sound really beautiful. You're almost creating for a split second a chord progression that's not there, but you create the illusion that it's there, and so it sounds like you did something brand new. There it is, that's wisdom, here we go, let's try it again. Oh, I didn't finish explaining it, so five. So, I'm five, da, da, three, six, two, six, five. Now, all these intervals I'm playing, you see these arpeggiated patterns? Notice that so G C C A F, which is like a F major arpeggio, just playing it backwards coming down. So what better way to get from to B flat than from the five of B flat, which is F, right? The F seven. so much you can do so let's have some fun
This is. I'm starting with dominant seven. That's what I play here. So. I'm sorry. You can go chromatic all the way down. And I'm using thing. I'm using patterns that are like. Um, Arpeggiated um, patterns you would normally put your fingers in those positions to play the bass. So that's the fingering I'm using instead of going, which would be really hard to get back to. And there's that minor six again. Remember, we talked about the minor. So the theory just kind of helps us justify what we're doing. Now, um, you'll explore so much more than what I've covered in this video. This is just the first phase. I can't wait to hear your questions. I can't wait till we get into the next phase of this where we start looking at the individual chords on the keyboard. And since I can't play both instruments at the same time, I'll have somebody help me so I can further explain what's happening there. And I can demonstrate what I could possibly do here. So hopefully that gives us enough to, st enough to start working on, the, again, the major and the minor. Um, the scale elements, the um, pentatonic elements, the arpeggiated elements, um, some of the licks that we covered and you know different riffs and things that you're able to do. Have fun with that. Please respond. Let me know what I'm not telling you that you need to know. I will show you. I guarantee you I will show you. Love you guys. Have a great day. That's all for right now. Talk to you later. Let's shout. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.